Okay, hi everybody. Uh, today we're going to talk about some of our most popular reptiles, and those are the bearded dragons. What you see here today are a couple different morphs, a couple different sizes. We do want to make sure everybody knows that these containers are not their homes. These are travel containers that we brought them in back to the photo studio so we could take a closer look without bringing their entire habitat. Uh, for a baby bearded dragon, which we call a hatchling, minimum 20 gallon tank. Uh, and for this guy, you probably want to move a little closer. We're going to show you the hatchling is, is smaller actually. Bearded dragons grow very quickly. So even though you can start them off in a 20 long, you're going to need to move up to something like a 55 gallon or even higher when they're adult size like this bearded dragon we see here. Uh, first 11 months of their life, they can grow several inches in a month. By the time they're about 18 months old, they're about full grown and then they'll continue to grow for maybe one to two inches every year. But the first 18 months of their life, they grow very quickly and uh, it slows down a little bit after the first 11 months, but they, they grow from, I'll show you here. Here's the little hatchling this size, and you're looking at just probably a few months older on this size. So you go from this to this in just a matter of months. So although you might look at this little bearded dragon and think, oh my, 20 long, that's gonna suit him just fine, not for long. So they grow very quickly as a lot of our reptiles do. And then at about 18 months, you're looking at almost adult size, which we have here, okay? So first we're gonna talk about what you need for a reptile besides the habitat. Uh, reptiles require heat, and these guys come from a dry area in Australia, so they like it pretty dry. And uh, the heat, so you don't want humidity like you would have a rainforest type of setup. You want more of a desert or grassland type setup. So we need heat, and during the day, you wanna use a basking bulb to heat them up Heated side of their enclosure can be anywhere 100 to 110 degrees. The other side, which we'll call the cooler side, be about in the 80s, somewhere in the 80s. We're going to use a heat bulb in most cases to use their daytime heat. So the proper heat for these guys allows their body to produce enzymes. Enzymes break down their food, allows them to build up a good, healthy immune system, and also allows them to basically just function normally. If these reptiles were a little bit on the cool side, you would see them being very lethargic. They might turn a darker color. Uh, they would not have good eyesight. So maybe when you tried to feed them their insects, they would go to grab it, but they wouldn't be accurate with their aim. That would indicate that they were a little bit too cool. So the heated side, 100 to 110, just in a basking area. So these basking bulbs provide heat and the difference between a basking bulb and a regular incandescent is the basking bulb's heat is more centered. So you get a particular spot for animals like the bearded dragons that love to bask. So you get a hotter area, more intense area of heat, but in a smaller area so they can definitely move away. When you see a reptile moving away to what we call the cooler side uh, and then back to the heated side, we call that thermoregulating. And that's what you should see them doing. If they're not thermoregulating, if they're just staying on your cooler side all the time, that probably indicates that your heated side is way too hot for them. If they're always under the basking light and they never seem to move away and get away from it, they're probably never getting hot enough. Now, the way we determine what the temperature is, is of course, with thermometers. Uh, we have different kinds of thermometers that we use in our reptile room. We have this type where you aim it in, you push the button, and it tells you what the temperature is. Uh, you can use that to determine what your basking temperature is and also what your cooler side is. We also have thermometers that stick on the glass. We have a lot of different kinds, but you don't want to just be taking a guess. You want to make sure you know what the temperature is and try and get it as close as possible to what we call their comfort zone. So this would be your daytime heat source. Your nighttime heat source is one that you want them to feel like it's dark, okay? So more natural. Natural habitat is what we're going for. So you don't want a bright light over them 24 hours a day. You want either a black or red bulb or one of these ceramic infrared um, heat emitters which will give off heat, but absolutely no light. Now, if you have a 100 watt day bulb, you probably wanna go with a lower wattage for your night bulb because you want the temperature to go down. Usually about 75 degrees is a good temperature for them at night. So you don't wanna have like the same wattage. You wanna use, if you have to have a 150 watt bulb per day, then you might, might wanna do 100 watt per night. And you wanna make sure you're checking the temperature. We usually like to recommend, if possible, People will come in, buy all these supplies that they need for their setup, go home and check it. Make sure it's running the right temperature. Make sure if they have moving water that the water is moving for them. 
Then come back and put the animal in because when you first take an animal home, any animal at all, this first couple days are very stressful because they're in a new environment. You want everything as perfect as you possibly can when you take the animal home. So if possible, get your setup first, come back and get your animal the next day or even a few days later. The other kind of light that a reptile requires is our sunlight bulb. Now these bulbs, when you put them on, they're not hot at all. You can actually run your hands against them. They don't put off heat. These bulbs put off rays like the sunlight and they allow the reptiles to use vitamin D, use vitamins and minerals from their food and keep their bones nice and healthy. Without this bulb, no matter how much great food you give them, no matter how many vitamins you sprinkle on their food, they cannot utilize the vitamins and minerals from that food without this bulb. This is an imitation of sunlight. One of the things that we do in the store is we have some store pets. We've done some videos on some of our store pets. They live with us uh, their entire life. Uh, and we take them outside a couple days every week for natural sunlight because imitation of natural sunlight. In Pennsylvania, we need to use these bulbs because in the winter, we're not gonna be able to take the reptiles outside for natural sunlight. So these are required. But the best thing in the world that you can give your reptile is natural sunlight. Of course, when you take it out, you wanna provide a place for it to hide, to be in shade, so it's not completely in the sun, and you wanna supervise it so it doesn't get out of any enclosure. In a typical setup, we'd have our daytime bulb, <clears throat> our nighttime bulb, and we'd have our fluorescent bulb. Anytime your daytime bulb is on, your fluorescent bulb is on as well. Those both get turned off at night to provide darkness for your animal, okay? All right, these guys are one of the animals that usually do not recognize standing water, especially when they're babies. When they get to be adults, sometimes they do figure it out, but in nature, they're usually drinking out of a moving waterfall or you know a puddle or they're drinking droplets. So we provide them with moving water. It can be something as simple as a water bowl, that's a water bowl with an air stone and an air pump. And that bubbles the water up, makes the water move. You can also mist but of course their environment needs to be dry. So when you mist, one of the best things to do is take their dish of fresh fruits and vegetables, mostly vegetables, very few fruits, okay, that's a little high in sugar, It'd be like a little treat for them, and you can mist the fruits and the vegetables that are shredded up, and that will also provide them with the water that they need. Now these guys have a varied diet. <laughs> As they're younger, they eat more insects. When they get older like this guy, they eat more fresh vegetables and a little bit of fruit. But when they're young, you wanna start, and you can see that we have it finely chopped up for these guys, and we keep it separated. Uh, some people make the mistake that when they're chopping up their produce, they're putting in the lettuce in the food processor, um, and then they're putting carrots in, put a strawberry in, and they're making basically mush. And the animals can no longer determine what's what, so nothing really smells like anything familiar because now it's all mushed together. So it's very important that you keep things separated and in little tiny piles and that way they can determine what it is that they like. Um, by the way, turtles and tortoises we found, they are always attracted to the color red. So if you have a turtle or tortoise at home, try feeding them like cherry tomato or strawberry. They're more apt to go after something that's red. I have not seen that proven on a bearded dragon, but we used to have some high school students come in, they did that experiment and they love the color red. So anything we offered them, if it was red, they went to that first, okay? Oh, this guy's cute. All right, sometimes bearded dragons are known to what we call wave. They'll actually look like they're looking at you and they're waving their arm. That is a sign of like submission. And you'll see bearded dragons will do that to each other sometimes. And they'll say, okay, I'm over here, you're over there, let's keep our distance and let's not get too close because I don't want to be afraid of you. I don't want you to be afraid of me. So they'll do that at people too. If you go into the reptile room and we have some of our hatchlings that they're together when they're this size. You don't put bearded dragons together when they're adult size. They're mostly a solitary animal. There are exceptions to every rule. But for the most part, you want to just have one bearded dragon, but when they're young, sometimes we can put them together. Uh, the one thing that we need to be careful of though is when they eat. If we have bearded dragons in an enclosure, we take them out and we put them in tubs, just like you see here, these little travel tubs, and we feed them in the tubs. Couple things. We don't want them to have a feeding frenzy, start going after toes and tails. And we also want to make sure that every single one of them is eating because you're always gonna have that one that's a little stronger, a little bigger, 
and he's going to go around and eat up most of the food, and the other one is going to continue to stay smaller and enough to eat. So we separate them out. We also don't want them to ingest any substrate. If we happen to have substrate on the floor, we don't want them to ingest the substrate when they're eating as well. So it's, it's a great idea. Even as an adult, you can keep him separated. We have tongs here. You could feed them with tongs. Um, or you could just put them in and let them go for the hunt. We'll see what he wants to do or if he's going to do anything here. And you see his beautiful color. We have many different morphs of bearded dragons. Uh, it used to be, you know, years ago, bearded dragons were just a normal bearded dragon. And then we have citrus, we have leatherbacks like this guy here. Uh, we have all different types of morphs, just like you do in the snake world. There are hundreds of different morphs of uh, ball pythons for one and uh, you just see different, different color phases. Now when we do feed them, you wanna make sure that the insect is small enough, okay? That size should be the size in between their eyeballs and no larger, so that's about as large as we're gonna go with that guy. You can eat it or you just wanna chase it, that's okay. Oh, this guy's like, oh, how about some for me? So that's a good guideline for size, is the distance in between the distance in between their eyeballs is about the size of the insect that you want to feed them. We'll try, oh, we'll try this guy here. Come on. Aha. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Yeah, like, I gotta let go of the tongue. There we go. Okay. Oh, eat one too, right? Mm -hmm. And they can eat many, many insects. For the hatchlings, like this little guy, he should eat lots of times. He can, he can feed him two to three times a day. That's why when they hatch out of their egg, which they do hatch out of their eggs. The breeders want to uh, get them into new homes right away because these guys are little eating machines. So they get fed at least twice a day in the reptile room. And we give them a variety of food, not just crickets. We have an entire case of a wall, basically, of different kind of feeder insects, including things like dubia roaches, silkworms, mealworms, waxworms. They're not all appropriate for the little guys, but as they get older, you can start to vary their diet with some dubias um, and uh, that's more nutritious. If we ate just one or two types of food, we might survive, but we're not gonna be nearly as healthy as if we were eating many different types of food. So you wanna vary the I diet. I recommend you take uh, your food from outside in the wild because of the fact that it could have been contaminated with a pesticide or even a fertilizer that you would not want then your bearded dragon to ingest. So we do recommend that you go with the, what we call farm raised insects that we sell in, in most pet stores. <laughs> These guys shed as they're growing, um, just like a snake sheds. Snake sheds because he's getting bigger, the outer skin gets too tight. He's wearing it because he's, he's wearing it out because basically he's crawling on his belly. And anytime that a reptile has an injury, such as a cut or a burn, they will also shed their skin as a way of healing themselves. When a lizard sheds, the lizard sheds in pieces. We have a shedding here from a tegu. And they shed in pieces, different parts of their body, uh, fairly close together, but it might take them a few days. They're not going to take it off in one big piece like you see here. Now this guy, he is shedding right now and if we take a look around his neck we can see a piece of shedding hanging there and there's some also on his tail now as we look at him we're going to get the idea of why he's called a bearded dragon they have a flap of skin underneath here and when they get threatened they will inflate that and it will look like they have a beard uh, so that's where they get the name bearded dragon these of course are his ears on the side of his head he is very smooth if you pet him from the head to his tail if you try to take your finger and run it from the tail up, you basically get stuck. And that's just because of how his scales are. He does swim. Uh, they're actually pretty good at swimming. They jump into the water and they inflate their lungs and their belly with some air and they can float for a while and then they can start swimming and if they get tired, they just float there and they float a little more. So they do that out in the water if they're feeling threatened. Uh, they could jump into water and just float downstream a little bit until they feel that the danger, the predator that was going to hurt them is gone. So they do tend to uh, float a little bit. If they lose their tail, they will not grow a new one like some of our other animals that we talked about. They may heal it into a little point, but they're not going to grow a full tail. Dragons, <laughs> they live an average of 10, sometimes 15 years, but 10 is about average. 
Again, they're going to grow very quickly in the first year, year and a half of their life. So you're going to mostly be looking at a, an adult size by the time they are 18 months old. We do have reptile vets. Uh, years ago, they weren't popular. You had a hard time finding a vet to go to with your reptile. But, you know, bearded dragons, they've been around for a long time in the reptile world. And there are a lot of vets that now do see exotics. So it's not as hard. And they should go to the vet typically at least once a year, or anytime you have problems, but at least once a year for a checkup, just like you would for your dog or your cat. We have a couple other food choices here. Just like you would open up a can of dog food or a can of cat food, we have we have commercial bearded dragon food. Now this one has, oh yeah, he's interested in that. It has some dried uh, leaves in. It also has some worms in it, some pellets, some extruded pellet food. So, you know, you can mix it up a little bit. Again, the more varied the diet, the healthier the animal's going to be. Yeah, it, it, usually uh, the formulas come in juvenile for those that are growing very quickly. And then the adult, which will have a little less of the fat in it. And of course, a little bigger pieces. So we have a setup uh, when they're young. We have this carpet terrarium liner. Uh, we like to use that again, so they're not ingesting any of the substrate, but even if we're using carpet, we're still taking them out and putting them into a separate container because otherwise, how are you gonna know how many crickets they've eaten? Because the crickets will promptly go underneath the carpet. So even though if you do use carpet, you still wanna feed them in a separate container. This is another choice on, on substrate, more of a soil. Uh, this substrate could go either way. You could, you could soak it for animals that need a little more humidity. Of course, for the bearded dragons, you just keep it dry. Uh, we have lizard lounges, lizard ladders <laughs> uh, to put in the cages. You want to try and give them different um, temperature gradients. You know, you put this in a corner somewhere and they can climb on it so they can get closer to the light or further away. So we have a gradient this way, horizontally, and then we also have a gradient vertically for those animals that do enjoy climbing a little bit, which the bearded dragons do climb. They're not going to go up to the top of the tree like an iguana, but they do like to climb a little bit. Hiding spots are important. They make an animal feel very secure. Without a hiding spot, they feel like they're vulnerable all the time, out in the open. Predators can get them any time. Won't be their predators in the wild. Other larger animals, including birds, coming from overhead. So you want to give them a hiding spot. You want to have one hiding spot in the heated side, one on the cooler side. That way they do not give up the heat that they need or the cool that they need for the sake of hiding. So this is important. And again, if you take them out for natural sunlight, you take them out, you put them in whatever enclosure you have that can securely keep them, and you provide them with a hide. So if they feel like they need to get away from the sun, they can do so. They can also get on top of the hide if they feel like they need to bask. Okay. So bearded dragons are very popular. Uh, you can probably see why. I mean, I think that they're, they're very active during the day. Some of our reptiles are nocturnal. These guys are diurnal, so they're active when we're active, which makes them a fun pet. Remember to always keep them in a large enough enclosure. These are only travel boxes. Make sure that you're only keeping one as an adult in an enclosure. You don't want to have two or more. There are exceptions, but for the most part, they need to be solitary. So you don't have any kind of uh, territorial uh, incidences. Okay. Thank you guys. If you have any questions, reach out to us on Facebook. Thank you.